Are we ready? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sunday morning worship service at Summit. Hello, everybody in Zoom land. When I drove in this morning, there were so many cars here, I thought maybe we were meeting in person and I didn't get the memo, but it turns out there's a voting center happening in the salon, so activity is happening here. Um, you're all at home, we're here. I've got Tyler and Josh and Patrick and Karen in the sanctuary with me, and Mary is standing by in the RE wing. So we're all here, ready to bring you our service for today. Um, as always, we're recording today's service and we'll turn it off for the community gathering. And now let us begin to enter the spirit of worship, turn our hearts and minds and ears and listen to our prelude. Good morning. Um, this morning, I'm going to play for you a piece by Philip Glass called Satyagraha. I'm not sure if I, how to pronounce that, but it means hold on to truth. It's a um, Hindi Sanskrit word. And um, it's also a, a description of nonviolent resistance to evil.
Well, good morning again. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of Summit Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. We are a liberal religious community bound together by shared principles drawn from world religions, humanist teachings, nature and science philosophy, and personal practices. We are a religion of love and inclusion. We aspire to the principles and purposes that are listed in the order of service. The mission of Summit is to commit ourselves to building a more compassionate, just, and sustainable world. If you are new to Unitarian Universalism or to Summit, would like to know more about us, I invite you to go to our website, summituuf.org, click on the visitors button, fill out the online connection card, and someone will follow up with you. As always, we want to acknowledge that our fellowship resides on unceded Kumeyaay land, and that for more than 10,000 years, this land has been and continues to be home to the Kumeyaay people. We recognize the violent history of colonization in California and honor the legacy of the continuing presence of the Kumeyaay nation. This morning, we do have a few announcements. Our board secretary, Carol Schnallbelt, wants to tell us about the upcoming annual meeting. Madam Secretary, are you here? I'm here, thank you. So as Katie said, I wanted to remind you about our annual congregational meeting that we will be having in two weeks. So it will be held on June 19th, immediately after the service. Uh, you should be receiving an email, so keep a, a lookout for that. Um, on In the email will be the agenda for the meeting, the slate of candidates, um, some budget information, and also some information about how to vote, especially if you have difficulty on Zoom. Um, I know that these roles that people um, play in our congregation um, often aren't too contested, but I do think the candidates need to know that they have your support and you can give them that through your vote. So please make time to join us uh, in two weeks on June 19th after the service. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Two weeks from today, same time, same place. And we have a brief announcement from Patrick. Patrick, you wanna come on up? Hey everyone, I'm back. Um, just to say that we have only a couple days left in the um, production of Hamlet that's running in the Marie Hitchcock Puppet Theater in Balboa Park. Um, we're part of the San Diego Fringe Theater Festival. Um, the shows are tonight at six, uh, I think Friday at like 9 p.m. So that was a little late. And then we have, uh, I'm pretty sure next Sunday at six. There's more details on the website and I'll send the link. And I think you have to get your tickets on the website. So that's a useful link. Anyway, come see the show. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Nine o'clock is way past my bedtime, but uh, okay. Well, I also have an announcement. I um, am happy to announce or sad to announce that today is my last time being a service associate for Summit. And uh, for the past two plus years, I really have enjoyed working with the rest of the team. Chair Joni Mountain has done a fabulous job keeping this committee going and this service is going. Working with Tyler, the technical, technical guru that we could not do without, and Josh and Pat and Lynn and Mary Tina, we've been a wonderful team and I've really enjoyed working with them during this incredibly challenging time. Because with only a part-time minister, we have had to recruit um, about three services a month. So over two plus years, you do the math. It's a lot of services. If you ever wondered about all those music videos, that was in large part my contribution. I had a steep learning curve to begin with to find out how to research and find hymns and songs that were relevant to the, the service and that were within the parameters of our music license, which I've also been managing. I've really enjoyed working with guest ministers and guest speakers in planning services, finding readings and chalice lightings and putting music together to create what we hope has been a meaningful worship experience. And then to serve as the host itself, or as somebody said, I act like a game show host. So uh, it's been fun to, to do that as well. Um, again, I've thoroughly enjoyed the challenge and the joy and the pleasure 
I like to feel that I've made a contribution to our worship services and been proud to be part of the team, but it's now time for me to move on and let others take up the task. And I am literally moving on. The end of this month, I will be moving to a little cottage at Frederica Manor, way down south in Chula Vista. So I will be leaving Summit after seven years. And I have really enjoyed the roles that I've played in my seven years here, leading pledge drives, um, organizing the UU the Vote Task Force, singing in the choir, and of course, the Sunday Services Committee. Now, like others, I am also very worried about the future of Summit, and I truly hope that the community can come back together after being apart and distant for so long. But I do see a crisis in volunteering, and I really encourage you, if you care about this community, step up and volunteer. Just on Sunday mornings, our Sunday Services Committee needs people especially tech support. Our ushering committee needs people to help usher. We need people to help put on social hour, people to help greet. There are many opportunities to participate. So if you take a look at your, your skills and your interests, and if it matches up with any of those, please step forward and help us move Summit into the future. One of the best ideas I had this past year was to invite Peter Bolin to be a guest speaker. Peter is chair of the Philosophy and Humanities Department at Southwestern College and a frequent and popular instructor at San Diego Oasis. His knowledge and experience and wisdom um, about all the world's religions and philosophies just really makes him a perfect speaker for, for us and for Unitarian Universalism. And today is his fourth appearance here during this past year, and I'm thrilled that he will be talking about Buddhism today, which many of us can relate to. Peter joins us from his home at Zoom, his Zoom studio. Peter, so glad you're here. Welcome back. And I'm so glad all of you have chosen to join us today for a time of reflection and connection. As always, I invite you to stay after the service for our community gathering, a time to chat with Peter and to share a joy or concern with the larger group. And I will now light the chalice. I will share with you the words of Eric Heller Wagner. Blessed is the fire that burns deep in the soul. It is the flame of the human spirit touched into being by the mystery of life. It is the fire of reason, the fire of compassion, the fire of community, the fire of justice, the fire of faith. It is the fire of love burning deep in the human heart, the divine glow in every life. And now let us enjoy our church UU hymn in both English and Spanish to reflect the multicultural nature of our region. Speranza fe amor, verda y viesa cantando de cada tierra, cada. Join with me as we recite our UU aspiration. May love be the spirit of this fellowship 
May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. And now it is time to welcome Mary in from the RE wing in time for all ages. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, everyone. I hope folks are doing well today. Let me just get my screen set so I can see what I'm doing. There we go. Yeah, it's kind of lonely here, just me and the stuffed animals, but I have something to share with you today. So it's a new month, it's June, and we have a new theme. And our month, our theme for this month for our services is celebrating blessings. And I think that this is a perfect way to start by centering in on um, acknowledging the blessings. Um, and today I want to talk a little bit about happiness and happiness to me is a blessing. And it's an experience of being in the moment and fully present. When I really find myself in a happy space, I'm full of wonder and curiosity and just being fully in that moment. And that may sound really simple, and it's complicated, right? It's complicated. So Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk, uh, wrote this book and taught us a simple concept uh, for children and all ages that I'm going to talk about today. Um, this book is a handful of quiet, happiness, and four, pedal, four pebbles. So um, I have four pebbles, and they are used for the focus of this meditation. Pebbles are nothing fancy, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. But there are many variations of this practice in this book, and you can also create your own variation. So I'm going to show you a very simple, basic one to start with, and then you can play with that. And if you come today to Summit, we can practice this. We'll have parking lot RE at noon. So, okay. So we begin with the four pebbles and these can be special rocks that you've collected or ones that you pick up in the moment when you're out and about um, in a moment of need. Now, now mine are from my rock bowl, one of my rock bowls at home. I have several bowls around my house with rocks because I really have this affinity for rocks as many of you know. And when I am out walking, if I find a rock that has a good feel for me, I'll pick it up and have it in my rock bowl. And then I'll, you know, when I'm done with it, I'll let it go. And or pass it on to somebody. These are four that I picked out when I was thinking about this story for you today. And they all rep are in this four meditation, these four pebbles all represent different aspects of nature. So a flower, a mountain, a calm water and space. So this is my flower rock. I thought it kind of looked like a flower petal. So it's kind of got that petal shape. This is my mountain rock. This comes from a place where I used to hang out as a child in Maine. This is my water rock. And I know you can't seal it, but it's really smooth from being smoothed by being in water. I think it came out of a lake or river. And this is my space rock. And I picked this because it has a ring around it. Kind of reminds me of the planet Saturn. So those are my four rocks. Now there's a fifth element to this meditation and that's your breath, your breath. So we will begin, and for this meditation, you don't need to close your eyes. You can just come as you are in the moment and you don't need rocks. You can use mine to focus on. So we start by breathing and breathe in. So we can all breathe in together. So you can just breathe in, take a deep breath. Feel that oxygen going into your body and then breathe out. And when we breathe in, you're nourishing your beautiful body getting that oxygen into your system. And when you breathe out, your body's releasing anything that it doesn't need. That's one more time, breathe in and breathe out. And when we're focusing on our breathing and just really staying present with that in and out breath, it helps to sort of let all the other things fall away and calm and you can really be in the moment. So keeping your breath natural, but centered, we're gonna pick up our first rock, our flower rock. And holding this rock, we're gonna use the following words. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. Breathing out, I feel fresh. Flower, breathe in, fresh, breathe out. In flower, fresh, out. And one more time to complete the cycle in 
and out. Now we're gonna pick up the mountain rock. I breathe in, I see myself as a mountain. I breathe out and I feel solid. Breathe in, mountain, out, solid. In, mountain, out, solid. One more time, in, mountain, and out, solid. This is my still water rock. I breathe in, I see myself as still water. I breathe out, I reflect on things that as they truly are. Breathe in water, out reflecting. In water, out reflecting. One more time, in water and out reflecting. And finally, I breathe in, I see myself in, as space and I breathe out, I feel free. Breathe in, space. Breathe out, free. Breathe in, space. And breathe out, free. And one more time, in, space, and out. Free. Now take a minute, place the palm, pebbles back in your palm, breathing in and out and thanking them and your beautiful body for your breath. And that's it, super simple. How do you feel? A bit calmer, a little more grounded, a little more present? You can use this pebble practice at any time or even adapt it for what works for you. And as I said earlier, our new theme for this month is celebrating blessings. And each moment we breathe in and out is a blessing. And we can check in with our, with our breathing at any time when we need to know that we need to remember. You know, you just check in. In Kung Fu Panda, you might remember this, Master, Master Olwe, Olwe says, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. And that is why they call it the present. So I like to remember that, that every time we breathe in and out, it's a gift, it's a present. And I hope this experience is, brings you to a greater discovery of the blessings that are in the moment. So that's my story for you today. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mary. The Unitarian Universalist living tradition um, is drawing from many purposes, one of which is wisdom from the world's religions, which inspire us in our ethical and spiritual life. And I found a reading that just really touches on this and speaks to me, and I hope it speaks to you. Uh, it's called Every Third Thursday by Joanna Fontaine Crawford. Every third Thursday, I am a Buddhist. I empty my mind and lighten my heart and try to let go of attachments. Every other Friday, I am a Christian. I look for the least of these and try to love God and my neighbor. The full moon of the moon month finds me Wiccan. I honor the dual nature of God and find my rhythm as maiden, mother, or crone. On the 15th of the month, I am humanist. I respect science, integrity of fellow humans, and all that we have learned and have made. Every fourth Wednesday, I am Hindu. I take a breath and understand that what is unfinished now will remain for me to continue next life. On alternate Fridays, I'm Jewish. May Adonai bless and keep you, I tell my children, softly touching each head. And the Thursdays and the Mondays and the Saturdays and Sundays and all the other days in between find me reading or listening or watching philosophers, Muslims, Mormons, Baha'i, and more fill my heart, touch my soul. And yet, the one thing that none of these provide to me is the certitude that they are the one. They lend me wisdom, sing to my heart, 
cause me to question, help me find answers, make me more me. And at the end of the day, every day, I am Unitarian Universalist in parcel and in pledge and with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind and all my strength, I honor this faith. I hold it close as it lets me run free. We are a fellowship supported entirely by the voluntary generosity of our members and friends, and we greatly appreciate our faithful pledgers who continue to keep up their monthly contributions. If you're moved to make a contribution today, we encourage you to do so. It's easier than ever to contribute to our virtual plate. The link can be found in the chat box and it will take you directly to the donation location. And now we will gratefully accept your generous donations during this musical interlude. Karen. Hello, uh, today I will play um, an intermezzo by Johannes Brahms, um, the Opus 116, number four. And it was part of a series called Capriccio Fantasies. Um, and it's, to me, it's very poetic. There's kind of a refrain that comes back that reminds, it's always turning different directions. It's a very meditative piece. I hope you enjoy it.
Our second reading this morning is from Buddhist writings. May every creature abound in well being and peace. May every living being, weak or strong, the long and the small, the short and the medium sized, the mean and the great, may every living being, seen or unseen, those dwelling far off, those living nearby, those already born, those waiting to be born, may all attain inward peace. Let no one deceive another. Let no one despise another in any situation. Let no one from antipathy or hatred wish evil to anyone at all. Just as a mother with her own life protects her only child from hurt, so within yourself foster a limitless concern for every living creature. Display a heart of boundless love for all the world in all its height and depth and broad extent. Love unrestrained, without hate or enmity. Then as you stand or walk, sit or lie, until overcome by drowsiness, devote your mind entirely to this. It is known as living the life divine. Our meditation hymn this morning is filled with loving kindness. The words are from a traditional Buddhist meditation and the music was written by Ian Riddell. You may remember him as a music minister at First Church, and he's spoken to us before as well. So let us enjoy this meditation. May we be filled with loving kindness. Good morning, everyone. I'm Peter Boland. 
And I'm just so thrilled to be invited here again. It's just wonderful to be back. And thank you so much, Katie. I did not know you were stepping down from your role and leaving Summit. That uh, comes as a surprise and a bit of a shock to me. And I, I just want to thank you personally first for reaching out um, all these different times, four times now, to have me come out here and be a guest. And I hope that y'all at Summit don't lose my email address. I'd love to come back sometime, whoever is taking over. So um, it's my privilege and I'm, I'm, I always humbly accept these invitations to come into this beautiful community and share these, these ancient wisdom traditions that I so love to teach and think about and, and even attempt to practice <laughs> on my better days. Uh, and I just want to say one more thing too about the service. You know, um, I have the honor of, of going around and speaking at a lot of different churches and spiritual communities. And, and those of you that, that spend all of your time here at Summit, I don't know if you're aware of the high quality music that you have here that, that Karen uh, plays, that Philip Glass piece, the bronze piece. Every time I'm here, I'm, my jaw kind of hits the floor. That's not how it usually sounds in a lot of places. And so y'all have a really good thing going and I hope you are grateful for that. Thank you for that beautiful music. I haven't heard that Philip Glass piece in years. Perfect, perfect send off for what I'm about to share with you. So let's think for a while about what Buddhist wisdom is. And, you know, in a, in a brief presentation like this, we aren't going to do the whole history of Buddhism and all the varieties and the whole story of Siddhartha Gautama. That's not what we're doing. But what we can do today, and, and I think what we always try to do, certainly in the Unitarian community, is, is scan the horizon of all these wisdom traditions for tools that we can use, that we can wield here in our everyday lives to become more conscious and awake and kind and, and, and well. And those themes are all well represented already so far in the service. So 500 years before Christ, there lived a man named Siddhartha Gautama in ancient India, and he grew up steeped in Hindu philosophy and spirituality. And what that means is he grew up steeped in the idea that all is one, the idea that our individual consciousness was an aspect of the whole an aspect, an element of the divine reality from which all of this poured forth. So our inseverable oneness with all energy, all matter, and all consciousness, that's the, that's the wisdom Siddhartha received with his mother's milk in, in his Hindu Indian upbringing five, six centuries before Christ. But and this is a parallel with Jesus a little bit. They both had some struggles with the institutional religions of their days. I would say that Siddhartha grew frustrated with the, the complexity and the hierarchical structure of the formal religion of the Brahmins of his day. And he began looking for his own path, which is what a lot of us have done and how a lot of us ended up here. So... Siddhartha began to commit himself to a course of study and a course of meditation, actually. And ha as, as legend has it, he became enlightened. He woke up. The word Buddha refers to that, right? The word Bud in Sanskrit, B-U-D-H, means to wake up. So when you all stop sleeping this morning, the, you, you booted. So we already booted once today. <laughs> And, and uh, it's a simple image, isn't it? It's a simple metaphor. You know, what I'm struck by here on, uh, on the Feast of the Pentecost in the traditional Christian world today, in our, in, we're our brothers and sisters in the Roman path, uh, Roman Catholic path, and the, Ang the, Ang the Anglican path. You know, the, the path, those traditional liturgical churches, they're, they're talking about the Pentecost today, that curious scene from Acts of the Apostles where the Holy Spirit came down and kind of like got up inside everybody. <laughs> so here in the, in the Buddhist tradition, we use the analogy of being asleep or being awake. But in the Christian tradition, there's a similar kind of, kind of thing going on. Are you kind of, kind of dead inside or are you kind of filled with the Holy Spirit? 
are you just going through the motions or are you on fire, you know? And the image that Jesus uses a lot in the gospels is the image of the visual perception. You know, do you have um, a beam in your own eye or do you not see the light? And so Jesus uses the image of, of blindness versus sight. And in Buddhism, the imagery is being asleep or being awake, but it's a similar theme, isn't it? Are you in modern words, are you unconscious or are you conscious? And that's all that we mean by awake. You don't have to think about awakening as some sort of cosmic mystical vision. It could be very ordinary. It could be something as simple as kind of unpacking our unconscious bias and racism, you know, unlearning a bunch of our conditioning, which is something that we're all so interested in doing. The way we do the land acknowledgement is, is, a, is a beautiful example of acknowledging that this land is unceded Kumeyaay land. And, you know, our critics on the right might derisively call that wokeness. But around here, we just think of it as honest truth-telling and a step in the right direction to acknowledge what is. So don't pack too much into this idea of wakefulness. Um, sometimes it's called enlightenment too, and we'll unpack that a little bit as well. But what did, what did Buddha awaken from? Well, maybe we could think of it this way. He, uh, he, he woke up from unconscious living, from conditioned consciousness. L let's keep this very simple. You know, when you and I were born, they brought us home from the hospital. We had just opened our eyes, just started hearing, just started tasting, just started touching, just started having all of the feelings, and we began to be imprinted, and they taught us a language, and with language came a value system, these things are good, these things are bad, here's what we like, here's what we don't like, this is true, this is false, and, and I don't think it was some sinister process, they you know, all of the people around us, our parents and our ministers and our teachers and society, they were trying to help us out. You know, they were trying to teach us what was what in their understanding. So we inherited this whole world view and we just accepted it. And part of growing up, you know, in your teens and so on, in your 20s, you start questioning all of that. You throw a lot of it away. You get into some good trouble. Um, you kind of fall apart and then you spend the rest of your adult life trying to put yourself back together. So that's the kind of conditioning that Buddha woke up from. So enlightenment or awakefulness, those are two metaphors for a shift in consciousness, a shift in cognition. That's at the root of Buddhism. That's why it's called Buddhism, right? In plain English, that, that would be awakenism. So this isn't really, it, you know, it gets lumped in with all the religions, as a world religion, but in, in its earliest form during Siddhartha Gautama's lifetime, he wasn't really a religious teacher. He never talked about God or the gods. And he just sort of left that over here. And he said, we need to work on some other stuff. How does our own thinking contribute to our own suffering? And so the word nirvana comes up, right? The word nirvana is also associated with enlightenment and awakening. It's a curious word. Uh, again, quite loaded, and it, take, it takes on other meanings in later Buddhism, but in original Buddhism, nirvana from the Sanskrit means literally uh, no wind, or it's often translated as to blow out, like as to blow out a flame, to extinguish a flame. So again, another image, right? Another metaphor, extinguishing the flame of egotism, of craving, of fear. Nirvana, no wind. It's a one word poem connoting stillness. Think of this think of an image of a pond in the forest on a very, very windy day. And, th and that windy day is making it difficult to even walk down the path. And you come upon you come upon a pond and it's so windy that the waves are rising up and the water's choppy and all the silt from the bottom of the pond has been stirred up and it's all muddy. And then imagine the wind stopping. And as the wind stops, it, it becomes perfectly still. And in that stillness, you see 
the waves vanish and the surface returns to mirrored glass, reflecting all the clouds in the sky. And the water gets so still that all the silt settles back to the bottom of the pond. And suddenly the water is perfectly clear and mirrored surface, no wind. With serenity comes clarity and depth. Maybe that's all we need to understand about nirvana right now not some future place where good Buddhists go after they die, but a state of consciousness characterized by serenity, stillness, and depth. And those of us who practice meditation know that meditation is a, a technique for facilitating the experience of the stillness, the clarity, and the depth that we are that we always carry within us, but which we don't usually pay attention to because our attention is turned out here. And so in my own thinking, I, I don't know, this is a really intriguing possibility. Again, I'm coming at Buddhism with you today to, to look for things that I can take with me into my ordinary everyday life that I can use. So here's something I notice about my own mind. Let's see if you notice this about your mind that I basically have two lists running all the time, two to-do lists. One of the to-do lists is all the things that I want to get, right? Let's put it this way, all of my cravings. You know, I want a cup of coffee. I want more money, just a little, not nothing rude or ostentatious. I want to have there be world peace. So there's this whole list of things that I want. And then there's this other list of things that I don't want. Let's use the word aversions. These are the things I'm trying to keep away from me. Uh, I don't want skin cancer, so I wear a hat when I go outside. Um, I don't want to run out of gas, so I keep my eye on the gas gauge. Uh, I don't want, well, I'll let you come up with your own list. I My contention here is that you and I have these two lists. Here's all the things that I want, and here's all the things that I'm trying to keep away from me. And don't we spend most of our time sort of figuring out how to get the things we want and how to keep the things that we don't want away from us? I mean, that's sort of our life is the management of these two lists, our cravings and our fears. Now, do a little exercise with me here. How would it feel? Not in your head. Let's, let, let's not do this analytically. How would it feel in your gut? How would it feel if both of your lists, your list of all the things you want and all the things you don't want, how would it feel in here if both of those lists just vanished? Whew. Gone. And suddenly there's nothing you need. Instead of wanting all this stuff, you realize I don't need anything. I'm shifting from the consciousness of acquisition into the consciousness of gratitude. Gratitude at how abundant my life is right now as it is. And instead of all those things that you are anxiously and fearfully trying to avoid, what if all of those things could happen and you'd be fine? You know, that neighbor you're having a feud with, you run into him at Costco. And instead of running to another aisle to avoid eye contact, you just say, hey, how's it going? All right, see you back in the neighborhood. No drama, no reactivity, no projection. Simple allowance. What if that's all we mean by nirvana? Coming into a consciousness not characterized by craving and fear and all the agitation that those two lists generate, but letting those lists drop, knowing that I have enough, that I am enough, and that I don't have really anything to fear. And then just getting to work, intending my best life, plant those tomatoes, you know? So what does an enlightened person know? In the Buddhist tradition, an enlightened person is aware that all forms are impermanent. Let's start with that, impermanence. The Sanskrit is anitya, anitya. Impermanence, yeah, this is something the Buddha taught continually, that all forms arise and all forms fade. It's such a simple fact, isn't it? But we don't accept it. 
every time something comes to an end, whether it's a beautiful day or let's go all the way, the, the death of a loved one. When something comes to an end, we feel a sense of ownership, don't we? We want to hold on to it. And Buddha argues that wisdom begins with the acceptance of impermanence. That when something dies or slips through our fingers, we say, thank you that you were ever even a part of this also very brief life. And I'm grateful for the time that we had together. Instead of now fixating on what I don't have anymore. So impermanence is where Buddhist wisdom really has to begin. The second is the, the fluid nature of the self. That the person who is doing the craving, the person doing the fearing, isn't a solid monolithic thing. That the human self is a kind of like a cloud. Some vapors coming in, some vapors leaving. That I am a fluid fog that moves through life. Sure, I ascribe continuity to my past, Peter Boland, but we know that all the cells in our body are roughly seven years old, some much younger. We have a new body every seven years. I have a new set of positions and experiences and opinions every other day. So in, in what sense am I a fixed thing? You know, that's a very Western idea, the eternal soul. But Buddha rejects that idea of personal solidity and permanence that instead like all other things i am a form made from the remnants of other forms that comes into existence for a while and then dissolve and everything is one everything is concomitantly or simultaneously arising and fading everything is causing everything else i know this is a big complicated metaphysical idea that i'm very just quickly sketching for you the sanskrit is anatman no self but the third idea is where I think Buddhism really, the rubber hits the road, and it's the word dukkha or suffering, maybe uh, dissatisfaction, right, or anxiety would be a better modern word for it, that life is generally characterized by unease, un uneasiness, you know, waking up at three in the morning, perfectly safe in your bed, but, but just worrying about everything that it seems to be a quality of our existence to be nervous and anxious and to fixate on problems instead of on the bounty and generosity and safety and beauty of our life. So impermanence, no self, and suffering. Those are the three marks of existence. That's what the enlightened person recognizes. And that last one, dukkha, is where the four noble truths start. So Buddha is, is looking for solutions, right? He's kind of like a therapist. You, he, 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 he has, a, he has a, a therapeutic path for you to follow the, called the four noble truths. Life is characterized by dukkha, you know, our dissatisfaction. Here's the second one. Most of our dissatisfaction is caused by me not getting what I want, craving. I go out to start the car and it, the battery's dead. Ugh. And I get all upset and I have to change my plans. And Now, why am I upset? Is it the battery's fault? Or is it my expectation that the car battery be immortal? <laughs> and we know that car batteries are not immortal. What is the source of your suffering? Is it other people? Is it the world? Is it circumstances? Or is it rooted in your own unreasonable expectations? You know, you don't, you don't like the weather. You want it some other way. Who made you the czar of the weather, right? It's just like you get what you get. And making peace with that is how we escape the, the, the life sentence of dukkha. Let me say it more simply. I think Buddhism is arguing that we are the authors of our own experience, largely. Sure, bad things happen. We'd have to deal with it. But that general day-to-day -day dissatisfaction is often rooted in our unmet expectations. And that is a very powerful takeaway for me. I find that really useful. And by the way, it aligns beautifully with what the Stoics 
teach Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, all those old Roman guys, that wisdom means practicing acceptance. And then from that stance of acceptance, then you get to work. Don't misunderstand Buddhism or Stoicism as the philosophy of, of uh, passivity and inactivity and just sitting there and taking, well, just the way it is. School shootings, what are you going to do? That is not Buddhism. That is not Stoicism. The counsel here is not to just accept everything the way it is. Acceptance is the first starting point. Then you get to work to help build a world that works for everyone. So the Four Noble Truths, life is characterized by suffering. Suffering is mostly caused by egoic craving. And if you want to reduce suffering, reduce egoic craving. Okay, how do I do that? How do I become less self-centered? How do I start accepting the conditions of my life? How do I stop comparing my spouse to some bizarre fantasy of what the ideal human being would be, which he or she can never meet, and instead love this miraculous human being that is sharing their life with me? How do I make that shift? That's where Buddha gets to work with the Eightfold Path. I'm not going to do all eight. The Eightfold Path is, is, is a series of eight suggestions about how to change the way you think, how to change the way you work, how to change the way you talk, how to change the way you meditate, how to practice mindfulness. And that beautiful meditation that Mary led us through today, tick, tick not on. I mean, is, is he not an international treasure? That's exactly how we begin this process of reprogramming the way we think. I think we're just in our conditioned consciousness so used to that rut of judgmentalism, of, of self-centeredness, of the culture of complaint. Everything's wrong. We just scan the horizon for things we don't like. Oh, look at him. He's not wearing his mask in the store. You know, it's, I'm really good at that, by the way. So and then you catch yourself. You're like, oh, look at Peter Bowen. He's being really judgmental right now. Notice how quickly the ego swoops in to every event and looks for ways to practice self-aggrandizement, to make you better than the other person. Everybody's driving like an idiot except you. This is what waking up feels like. So the, we're, we're talking really about the perils of attachment, attachment to our own thinking, actually. There, there's a wonderful uh, story about Zen Buddhist story about two monks, an old monk and a young monk, and they're walking through the forest to visit a far off monastery. And they get to a really swollen stream during the rainy season. It's going to be hard to ford. And they look upstream and they see a beautiful geisha in her silk kimono and big platform shoes. She's also trying to get across this creek. And the young monk sees her and does nothing. And the old monk sees her and walks over and introduces himself and lifts her up and carries her across the stream and puts her on the other side. She says, thank you very much. And off she goes. And the young monk is horrified. And the two monks continue to the far off monastery. And late that night, the young monk can contain himself no longer. And he says to the old monk, I can't believe you touched that woman. What are you doing? We're monks. We've taken a vow of celibacy. We must never touch women. And he's blathering on and on. The old monk's just like looking at his wife. Yeah, okay. Finally, the young monk runs out of gas. And the old monk says, I put her down at the river. Why are you still carrying her? Little stories like that tell us very quickly that Zen Buddhism and all Buddhism is, is, is cautionary about attachment to our own ideologies even. That young monk wasn't wrong. Monks aren't supposed to touch women. But through his love and attachment to the rules, he, com he was completely blind to simple kindness, simple compassion. That old monk, that was not an erotic experience. He was helping another human being. That's it. But the young monk in his fundamentalism could not see that. So that, sure, we can be attached to material things. We can be attached to anything. But I think one of the beautiful takeaways of Buddhism is that, that, that we can learn how to be more humble and move into a deeper present consciousness, present moment consciousness, appreciation, 
and always do meditate on the fact that all of these forms do not belong to us. The whole concept of private property is a kind of a social construct, a little bit of a game, and that we must let go of all of it, sometimes suddenly and without warning. What if we began to practice that renunciation all the time and to be ready for the impermanence to once again sweep away some of the forms around us. This is how Buddhism suggests that by realizing a few simple insights, we can jettison much, not all, but much of our suffering. And here's the beautiful part, and I'll wrap it up here. We don't have to know what happiness is. You don't have to define it. You don't have to hunt it down and drag it back to your cave. You don't have to explain it. We simply, here's the promise of Buddhism, we simply have to relinquish the illusion that we are in control or that we own any of this. And we do that, again, through service, through right mindfulness, through meditation, through the practice of, of compassion. To step into this next now moment, open-minded, open-hearted, humble, aware, present, grateful, attentive, to let go, to empty out. The great Christian mystic Meister Eckhart put it that way, that God is not found through a process of addition, but through a process of subtraction. That when I clear out my egoic fear, my egoic craving, when I let those two lists drop, happiness is our default state. Joy simply arises from within. When we remove the interference, maybe that's what awakening means. The great 20th century teacher, Krishnamurti, was asked once at a talk he gave, what's your secret? And he simply answered, I don't mind what happens. I don't mind what happens. Five words that sum up all of Buddhism and really many of the world's great wisdom traditions. I hope you found something useful for, for your own journey uh, down this path called life. As Ram Dass said, we're all just walking each other home. And maybe it isn't answers and explanations we're after. We're just looking for a little more light on the path ahead. And I love turning to traditions like Buddhism for that light. Namaste.
As we close our service by extinguishing our chalice, I invite you to stay afterwards for a time of community gathering and also encourage you to return next week when uh, Reverend KC will be making their farewell appearance. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Let us enjoy our closing circle song. And thereby ends our service. The uh, recording should be.